Good evening, I'm Jeff Koinenge, and this is Jeff Koinenge Live. First of all, apologies for starting this program late, and it couldn't have happened at a worse time because my guest just happens to be one who keeps time. Moving on. The topic, the question we're asking tonight, what are UK-Kenya relations like? Well, if you had asked people two years ago when the Jubilee government came in, they would have said frosty at best. Two years later, travel advisories still in effect. Huge British troop presence in Nanyuki, something like 10,000 troops a year in rotation. What else? So much to talk about. My guest, this is a different kind of inspiration Thursday. He's been in government for the last 18 years, which means he must have started when he was three, <laughs> because he looks like he's 21. <laughs> I tell you, he's been all around the world, Middle East, Washington, D.C., you name it. And now for the last three years and change, he's been British High Commissioner to Kenya. Dr. Christian Turner, CMG, whatever that means, is my guest for the next hour. Start tweeting at HCC Turner, at Koinanga Jeff. The hashtag is JKL. Hello, Z. Good evening. Good to see you. Very good to be back, Jeff. 21. What, me? Most people think I'm 12. <laughs> when you show up for a function, do they say, hey, Sonny? Well, a lot of people say, are you the son of the British High Commissioner, or are you really the High Commissioner? So, uh, I think most people by now know that plastic surgery is very good. And who's your doctor? I wouldn't possibly share that information. Is that classified? On live TV. Highly classified. Okay. Pelosi, good to see you on the show, and great for you to come Same. here. Thank and apologies for, me, for the uh, late start. I will live with a bit of East African stretch time. I'm used to it by now. <laughs> I'm sure you are. You could tell me stories about it. Okay, so as early as yesterday, Internal Security Minister, uh, Major General Joseph Kayseri, admitted there was a lapse in security during the Garissa attacks. Mm. A couple of days before the attacks, I remember you all issuing a travel advisory. You mm. all saying there's an imminent threat on this country. Mm. The Internal Security Minister has admitted that. What do you say? I mean, what is it? Well, look, first of all, I think um, we need to be very clear. This is a shared threat, and therefore is a threat we have to respond to together. Um, 147 Kenyan kids lost their lives. The world has shown solidarity. People of Britain, people all over the world, the Queen has sent a message of condolences. Um, the, the evil that was perpet uh, perpetrated outrages uh, everyone. Uh, in those situations, we all look for who to blame. We look yeah. for uh, the reasons why, what went wrong. Mm. And, and don't get me wrong, it's important to learn those lessons. Did you share your intelligence with the Kenyans? Uh, so uh, I don't want to get into specifics about exactly what was shared with whom when. But what I can say is we do have a very close and a very effective intelligence relationship between our two countries. But the fact that the, the intelligence was relayed to the local police and they didn't act on it, what does that mean? What well, does that say? No, I didn't go that far, Jeff. What I'm saying is that it's, it's fantastically difficult for any government in the world to deal with this kind of threat. You know, we have had similar attacks in the UK, the 7-7 uh, bombings, we call them on the underground in 2005. Uh, you see many other countries facing this sort of threat in today's world. Uh, I, I just think that uh, it is almost impossible to know that at two o'clock on Thursday, at this place, something bad is going to happen. You never get that level of specificity or warning. Sure. So what we have to do is work together to try and stop those threats uh, where we have hints that they might begin to happen. Yeah, and that working together means there's a lap somewhere, there's a breakdown somewhere, because, like I said, two days before, you all had the intel. You well, look, all were saying I, up and down the coast, mm -hmm. avoid Mombasa, avoid Malindi, avoid these places. I, I'm full of admiration for what Nkaisari has done. The general has come out and he said, look, not everything went according to plan, uh, not everything went as it should have done, and we will learn from that, and we will try and uh, put the lessons in place. I think my assessment would be that the way uh, the government responded to the Garissa attack uh, showed that a lot of the lessons from the Westgate atrocity have been learned. Uh, and I see nothing but determination in the Kenyan security apparatus to get that right uh, and to keep the people of, of Kenya. There are people who would disagree with you, Belosi, because it took six, seven hours to get the GSU, the recce squad, all the way there. They ha some of them even had to go by road while the officials flew by helicopter. People would disagree that we've learned anything from Westgate. Well, the two situations are very different. Uh, and in, in, in each of these occasions, to, to, to stop 
what you've got, which is lone gunmen moving around a campus who don't know what it looks like. I think, uh, yes, there's plenty of stuff we need to build on and develop. But as I say, any country in the world would have found this difficult to deal with. And I think what we need to focus on now, it's that sharing point, it's that solidarity. Working together to try and tackle this threat yeah. uh, at source. Okay, brings me back to the travel advisory below. Is he Again, you know, these travel advisories are destroying, if anything, our tourism industry. Mm. When do you lift them? When are they not lifted? What, you know, when can you advise us? Because you still have a tra travel advisory in effect. Yeah, we do. And, Jeff, I want to be absolutely uh, as candid and as undiplomatic as I can on this. Uh, first, the travel advice is not political. It is based on one thing and one thing alone, and that is an objective assessment of the security situation on the ground. That process is decided in London, and it's exactly the same across the world. Uh, there is no uh, variation, so we have to look at uh, that threat, and we, like every country, have a responsibility to our nationals. And I, I, you know, Kenya does the same, and I think we all understand that. Uh, I get a lot of questions, and people ask it all the time, but we don't see you doing advisories elsewhere. Actually, we do. So if you look at the list of countries in the world that Britain currently has travel advice against, it is like Kenya, a list of friends. Egypt, India, Thailand, Tunisia. We issued an advisory against Canada after the awful attack they had against their parliament buildings. We did the same in Paris. With Charlie Hebdo? Charlie Hebdo. Another awful attack. We had a travel advice. Baltimore? Baltimore? Yesterday, we issued advice against British citizens to warn of the, of the disruption in Baltimore. So this isn't personal, this isn't picking on Kenya, this is just how our system works. Now I accept that damages the Kenyan economy. Yeah. Do I want to see that? No. Does that worry me? Yes, it does. There are kids who had jobs on the coast in Kenya that we would prefer to see in, uh, in work and the tourism industry thriving. That's good for British interest. That's good for British business. But the way to get those jobs back, the way to deal with this is to tackle the causes, which is the insecurity, not the symptoms. Absolutely. And speaking of insecurity, what are we doing right now as a nation from your vantage point? Are we sitting ducks? Are we, are we sitting and waiting for the next attack? Because it seems we've been pretty reactive thus far. We're not proactive. Your thoughts? <sighs> Well, look, I mean, this comes back to my point that it's, it's, it's almost impossible for any government. You've got to react to events. You know, there is a threat that is emanating from al-Shabaab. That has got to be dealt with. And I should say, look at what KDF have done north of the border. I mean, Shabaab are now weaker than they have been uh, for three years. They're uh, under siege. Their leadership has been decimated. Uh, that is perversely why they're reaching out and trying to attack to show that they're, they're strong. So keep up that effort. That's not reactive. What KDF has done in Somalia, very proactive, and it's something we completely support. Do you, I was going to follow up and ask, should KDF pull out? Because there's been a lot of criticism. What are we doing in Somalia if we can't? man that porous border what are we doing in there but why not bring the troops here yeah. and guard this part yeah. rather than in there I, I i would not support uh a, a withdrawal from somalia by kdf uh, amazon is doing a very important job to help stabilize the country to create the space under which its po politics can grow and it can get back on its feet again to withdraw would create uh, all sorts of problems. So I don't think that is the answer. When you look around the region of Balozi, you see Ethiopia has troops in Somalia. Mm. So does Rwanda, so does Uganda. Mm. And of course, Kenya. But we're the only ones who seem to be the soft target. Mm. Why, do you think? Well, this plays to a point. There's no simple answer to that. If there was a magic wand in this, we would have found it. But I think there is a very important message from a lot of our experience in the counterterrorism effort. And that is working with communities. So earning the trust of communities is absolutely critical to beating terrorism. That means conversations with leaders. That means uh, countering radicalization, countering violence extremism. Uh, we found this out the hard way. Northern Ireland, 30 years of the troubles, we tried to win this through hardware. And actually it was hearts and minds. It was ideology. I'm not saying be soft. And I worry that when I say talking with communities, people think this is somehow cuddly, you know, mm. hug a terrorist. Mm -hmm. Absolutely not. This means be, be very tough about clamping down on what is, what is evil activity. But if at the same time, you're not reaching out and understanding the causes that drive these people uh, to, to, to radicalization, yeah. we won't ultimately win this war. And for me, that now is the priority for us together 
is to work on that trust building, that work with communities. I think we saw from Garissa, the reports coming out of Garissa, is that terrorism has now become homegrown. Mm. These guys did not come from across the border. They are homegrown. Mm. So in other words, radicalization is happening. Mm. And people have been talking about it for a while, but now it seems like a reality. How do you de radicalize those youth who are already who are already radicalized this, and this is a fantastically complicated area uh, as i say I, I, I don't say this boastfully but i think the brits are among the best in the world at doing this the experience from northern ireland some of the experiences we had in iraq and afghanistan and of course our own significant muslim population remember those seven seven bombings yeah uh the terrorists in those bombings were were british uh, born and yeah. bred uh, look at the experiences we've had recently with ISIL. Mm -hmm. uh, the British government assesses that about 500 uh, fighters from Britain have gone to fight with ISIL. You saw this story of these three Scottish girls, yeah. schoolgirls. What leads those schoolgirls to say we're going to get on a flight, we're going to cross a country, we're going to get to a border, and we're going to go and fight with a, uh, an outfit who to any normal person has this vile ideology. Mm. I think to find a single reason for that is very, very difficult. Some people say, oh, it's because KDF are in Somalia. I don't think that's the case. Some will say, well, it's because um, of poverty. Well, people will certainly feel marginalized. It's probably about dignity. It's about anger. And only when you get into those very specific root causes at community level can you start understanding how to counter it. Yeah, okay. Speaking of radicalization, and you know, there's, there's a lot that goes into tuning those minds, into brainwashing yeah. those young minds. And, and you know, it's happening more and more. And people say, look, it's poverty, it's lack of employment, it's so many factors. Mm. Are we winning the war, this hearts and minds war, are we winning yeah. it or is, is there a lot of work to be done? I think there is work to be done. Uh, and as I say, to, to, to start that journey, uh, there's a lot of good discussions happening. There was a big conference in Washington that uh, we were all involved in. Uh, the government is planning another very important conference at the end of May. We will all be part of that. Um, but your point in ideology is, is the key one I am making. So where, where are these ideas coming from? Actually, very few of them are in mosques. Uh, and this is our experience as well in the UK. Uh, I hear uh, Muslim friends, they talk about Sheikh Google shake Twitter to talk about our friends in social media. Yeah. The ability of these ideas to percolate now is very, very powerful. You know, why is it that you can go on a street corner and you can find a, a CD from uh, Sheikh Rogo that is basically preaching hatred and evil? So you've got to go after that ideology. We have a program in Britain called Prevent, and it, it is what it says. It, it's trying to prevent people becoming radicalized in the first place. Tackle the ideology, interventions at grassroots, rehabilitation in prisons, uh, in the community, and then looking for those who are most vulnerable and trying to encourage moderate voices rather than the radicals. Comes back to my question, do you share that intel that you have? You must have intel on all these people, all these people who are straying, who are being radicalized. Do you share with the locals? Yeah, we do. And look, there is an enormous amount of security cooperation that happens between our two countries, uh, as you would expect as two old and close partners. And going back to how you framed this debate in the, this discussion in the opening, uh, my difficulty with a lot of that security stuff is it's like an iceberg. Four-fifths of it sits beneath the waterline, and I quite properly can't talk about it, not in private, not in public, for operational and security reasons, but it's there. There are a lot of things that we do do that I can talk about. I'll give you some examples, if I may. Security at the airport. You've seen me down at the airport handing over bomb detection equipment, mm. making sure that is a safe hub for everyone to travel through. Uh, work at the border. Uh, we uh, gifted about 100 million uh, shillings worth of equipment to the, uh, the rural uh, border patrol unit to help make that border secure. Uh, our military relationship, which I'm sure we'll come on to, yep. uh, very, very important mm. part of help keeping us uh, both secure. Our national crime agency, that drugs hall, down on the coast, yeah. uh, all that heroin found. That was a joint Kenyan-British operation. Uh, the, uh, uh, the pedophiles who were rounded up in Gilgil, yeah. again, a joint operation where we're working together. Uh, the police, as well as up at Loresho Police College, launching a staff course to help with police reform, where we were bringing experts across from our police training expertise center, Brams Hill. All these things happen day in, day out. They don't get a lot of noise. They don't get a lot of fanfare, but that is exactly what two countries, yeah. as close as ours, with the solidarity we have on these security issues, should be doing together. Chicken gate? Chicken gate. 
You do know that I do not serve chicken at the British High Commission residence <laughs> anymore, Jeff. <Jess. laughs> <laughs> but look, ser serious points. Yeah. Serious points. Yes. That is a good example as well. Right. You know, we can we can talk about the corruption yeah, but, piece. But folks were jailed over there, but nothing happened over here. Yeah, but look, we are doing our part, okay? <clears throat> we say we have evidence that there was corrupt practice. I don't have the ability to investigate all those here. That's what the EACC is now doing. Yeah. But in the British jurisdiction, we had evidence of British nationals doing illegal things to jail. Pelosi, you want to take a break, come back, talk about what you were saying. Troops. Batuk? Batoks? Batoks? Batuk. Ba ba Let's not slip up on that one, Jeff. I'm sorry. I, I, it just, I can't help it. Batuk. Batuk. 10,000 a year rotating. That's correct. We want to talk about that and what they add to the economy. And also, what, someone on Twitter was asking, why not move Batuk to the Kenya-Somalia border? Don't answer. Also, your relationship with President Uhuru Kenyatta. Are you guys tight? Are you fist pumping? At HCC Turner, at Crane Anger Jeff, the hashtag is JKL. We're getting insights into the relations between the UK and Kenya. And who better than the 23-year-old UK ambassador to Kenya, <laughs> Dr. Christian. How can we, doc, you got your PhD at what, like seven? 24. We'll be right back in a moment.